Hi, my name is Lou D'Andrea. I work at Wolfram Research, and today I'm going to be talking about building maintainable dynamic interfaces. I'm going to take some of the lessons that we learned building Manipulate and other built-in interfaces and uh, show the structures that we use and the best practices that we've used that we've learned from them. I think this notebook is available on the conference website already. It will continue to be available on the conference website uh, after today. There are going to be a few sections in this notebook marked as bonus, which I am not going to open during this talk. Those are for you when you get back to your home base to review at your leisure um, that dig a little bit more deeply into some of the issues that I will be shining a light on uh, today. And this is very much a sort of nitty gritty uh, code based talk. This is not uh, arm waving. There's going to be lots and lots of code samples. Um, and I see the door is shut, so I'm going to take that as my cue. Hi, my name is Lou DeAndre. I work at Wolfram Research. Um, and I was around when uh, Manipulate was born and when a few of the other interface things were born in version 6. This talk is going to be going to illustrate some of the best practices we discovered while doing that, while building Manipulate and since then while building similar interfaces. Um, my thinking is that you, in your wisdom, will want to go off and build your own Manipulate-like functions, uh, functions that generate an interface on demand, and perhaps you have already climbed the mountain of dynamics, you've understood Manipulate as a consumer, and that's great. If you haven't, there are some fine resources available linked from this notebook, which you should go get from the conference website if you haven't already. Um, and consider this a sort of a 300 level course in building interfaces. Uh, we're going to be focused very uh, minutely on a couple of interesting details that I think will go a long way to making your uh, interfaces uh, more maintainable and more long-lived. Um, and feel free to stop me as I go. If you have questions, if you have uh, very, very detailed questions, I'm happy to stick around after this talk. I know that this is one of the final talks in the conference, and it's, I'm competing with, I think, a couple of other people and Papa Dells when we're done. So I think I could hold my own. If people wanted to chat with me afterwards, um, feel free. So uh, principle of programmatic generation, we, we outlined some principles of uh, dynamic a few years back. And uh, every interface should be generated by a program. There are kind of two classifications that I put these under. One is, um, you, you generate an interface once and then you store the result and then users just use the thing that you've stored. So palettes are a good example of this. We use this a lot in-house for things like dialog boxes. Um, I'm not going to be talking about this class of things. I'm not going to be talking out about interfaces that live by themselves in a dedicated file. Rather, I'm going to be looking at interfaces that are generated as part of your input-output REPL cycle in the notebook front end. Um, so you have a manipulate input, you get a manipulate output. What should that output look like? What should the boxes of that output look like in order to have an interface that's easily maintained, easily updated, um, can stand the test of time? And here I've listed a handful of interfaces that we have in output in various functions, from various functions. Um, and many of them use exactly the techniques that I'm going to be displaying here today. OK. So, uh, what's the big deal? Why don't we just say, well, we have a bunch of interface constructs. We have layout constructs in the front end. We have controls. We have this beautifully robust um, and deep notion of variable values and variables that change and trigger other things to, that should update. So we have you know, column and slider. So this is, this is a nice sort of first low-level approximation of manipulate. Um, and if we were to take a look at the boxes, which I assume all of you know how to do because you're in this 300 level class, um, we see a grid box and a slider box. So we're taking some of the information about this interface and burning the details into the notebook itself. Right? These boxes exist in the notebook. If we save the file, they're in the notebook file. Um, we can never cha automatically change that slider to a uh, manipulator, for instance, that had animation controls in addition to the continuous um, control. Um, and in the case of manipulate, of course, it's not just a slider and a dynamic display. It's also localization. It's also beautification in various ways, um, styling and whatnot. And so here we have a, a first level, second level uh, simulation of, of manipulate. And the boxes correspondingly are quite a bit longer. 
as you might expect, because we've got quite a bit more box generators in the input. Well, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we've, we've built up more features in this output, but we've also paid a, a price of that. And if we go all the way to the end of what manipulate would have been if we went this route, this is not manipulate, but if we were to have gone this route, uh, manipulate as a whole would have been a pages and pages and pages and pages of boxes. And all of these boxes burned into notebooks for every manipulate output. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's bad in a couple of ways. One is it makes your notebooks really big, even though they don't need to be. A lot of the stuff from one manipulate to the next is common. The layout functions are common. Um, it also locks us in for that particular manipulate output. It locks us into a specific rendering. If we choose at some point in the future to make manipulators look different or have the arrangement of the boxes in manipulate look different, um, these, the, the boxes that we've already burned in for previous outputs would all have to be thrown away and regenerated. Um, and it also locks, so it's not just the graphic design that's locked in, it's also the implementation that's locked in. So if there was some subtle bug in the dynamic that we're spitting into these notebooks, um, you know, how do we fix those? Well, again, you'd have to throw away all existing outputs and start over. So for the demonstration site, for instance, which has how many thousands of uses of manipulate at this point, that would be a significant chunk of Wolfram Research's time, and I'm sure many of you have dozens, if not hundreds, of manipulates. It'd be a significant um, Maluse of your time. But luckily, we avoided all these things, and we can do better, and we did do better. Um, so the goals that we decided on during the version 6 cycle was to only store what's absolutely necessary to display the interface in the notebook. We only store the bare minimum that's, so, and, and everything else, we attempt to use the dynamic mechanism to recreate the rest of the interface from the state that we have stored. Um, the, the look of things should be responsive to the user's environment. So if there's options and such that the user has set, those should automatically somehow um, flow in. You know, if they change the, the, the font family of output cells, that should automatically flow into the output family, the, the, the font family that's used in, in Manipulate. Um, we also wanted to make sure that once you generate a Manipulate, that would continue working as well as it can for the lifetime of that cell or that notebook file, or you, I suppose. Um, and if, you have new, if we decide in the future that we want to add some new features to manipulate that cannot be rendered, say, on an older front end, because we introduce some new control, we introduce some new box, um, we wanted to have a nice way, some nice uh, backward compatibility shims so that if you tried to open these newer notebook constructs in an older front end, yes, you wouldn't see the newer constructs in the older front end, but you also wouldn't just see random pink boxes and random failures. You would see kind of a nice, neat um, fail condition. So these were the, these were the goals, um, and I want to dig into several of these as we go. Um, but first, let's get our bearings about what we, I showed what we didn't do for Manipulate. Um, now I want to show you what we did do. So for Manipulate, the box structure which we will look at now, is a little more than a page in this extreme magnification, 200% magnification. It's still a little more than a page of stuff. And what is the stuff? Well, there's a dynamic module box, which is the way that we store, we serialize um, things. There's a bunch of state that we're preserving in that dynamic module box. Among, you know, the important things here are the local value of the, var the value of the local variable, the current value of the local variable, the current value of whether someone has chosen to hide the controls in that little plus icon, they can hide controls, um, the list of, of bookmarks that they either added in the input or interactively added while, inter in, while, while using the manipulate, and so on. So there's a set of, there's a set of state information that didn't exist that doesn't exist anywhere other than in this cell. So this cell needs to remember it. But the actual display of the manipulate, well, that's a, there's a function that creates that. Given the values of all these variables, there's a function that creates the manipulate, the look of the manipulate. And in order to create this, these boxes at render time, we merely need to call this function from inside of a dynamic. 
So this function that generates the boxes, had we not wrapped it in dynamic, this would have expanded out and we would have seen panel box and grid box and all manner of other boxes. Notice there is no panel box or grid box or for that matter even row boxes anywhere in this box structure. Um, those are all hidden through the indirection of a dynamic call to a utility that actually builds the interface boxes. And that's the majority of what's in this dynamic module. So it's dynamic module box, some state, and a dynamic call to the function that builds the interface. This is the pattern. Um, let's look at some other examples. So interval slider, and another example of a control of a thing that was built entirely in top level. Those of you who don't, haven't seen interval slider before, I think it's, I don't need to explain what it's doing. Maybe I'll explain how it's doing this. So this is a locator pane um, and the, the, gra the bar in the slider is a, is a rounded end line with, a, with a, an edge form applied to it. These guys are inset images. Um, but if you were to look at the boxes for this slider, you wouldn't see any of that. You would see this is just a dynamic call to a function that builds the interface. We're not burning any of the details of this into the notebook. So in this case, we don't even need any extra state information. All of the state information is, well, where should the thumbs be? And where should the thumbs be isn't a, a question that needs to be answered by the interface. It's a question that's answered by the value of the user's variable. So that's in the user space. Everything else can be, can be deduced from this function. So we have a dynamic call to a function that creates the interface. And I'll mention one other example. Um, I have these outputs stored in the notebook in case the uh, network was flaky. Um, so here is an audio. You know, we have a two minute uh, body of audio here, which I won't even try to play, I suppose. But you would expect two minutes of audio data, that takes up quite a bit of space. So how, much, how many bytes is this one output contributing to the size of my notebook? Um, oh, and I said I wasn't gonna evaluate that, but I did. Uh, well, let's see, that's it. Again, at this high magnification, this is what, a page and a half of stuff. And looking uh, slightly more closely, we see dynamic module of some state information. One of the pieces of state information is a pointer to the URL where the audio actually lives. Um, and then a dynamic call to a function that builds the interface. Okay, you're probably sick of hearing me say that by now. Here's the first of your bonus content. Again, I'm not gonna be opening any bonus content during this talk. Please get this notebook, take it home, take a look at it. Um, but overall view here, we have, if there's state information that you need, dynamic module to save the state, and then a dynamic call to a kernel function that creates the interface. And there might be some other things like deinitialization, initialization, if you need, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about initializing stuff uh, in just a minute. Any state information that needs to be stored should be in the dynamic module's first argument. Anything in the dynamic module's second argument should probably just be a dynamic call to that utility function. Um, and you're not burning the details of this into the notebook. You want to keep all of this nice and modular so that if you decide to change your definition of that utility function that displays the interface, your users don't need to do anything uh, other than install your new code uh, to see the results in their, in, their new, in their old outputs. And you have also seen, uh, in the case of Manipulate and others, that there might be a layer around the dynamic module, a tag box, interpretation box, something like this. Um, this is so that the interfaces can be used not only as output, but you can reuse the interface itself as an input. So tag box and interpretation box are two ways that, uh, that you might get your hands on the thing, that's, that, 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 that the thing that is getting sent back to the kernel when you evaluate one of these interfaces. Um, and that's important for us. It may or may not be important for interfaces that you build. Okay, so that's the high level stuff. And now I want to dig into some of the lower level bits, um, uh, including common errors that people make when they first start following these kinds of uh, patterns, how to make sure that your code is loaded, how to give your user a nice experience when your code is being loaded, how to communicate with the global scope, between the global and, and local scopes, um, and so on. Okay, so first, common mistake. Um, how does one make sure that 
uh, the values of variables, if you're using this utility function, you want not just the value of the variable to be passed to the utility, but you want to know what the variable is. You want to have your hands on the variable itself, not just its value. Um, so here, I'm following the pattern that I just laid out. I have this brand new my interface function that I'm really proud of. Um, and it's dynamic module of some state and a dynamic call to a function that displays an interface. Okay, great. What is that interface? Well, uh, that interface in this case is just a pair of sliders. It's a slider for the local variable that the user doesn't know anything about necessarily and a slider for the global variable that they passed in. And here's an example of it. So I evaluate this and I'm, I'm um, so excited and I try to drag these around and nothing happens. Well, why is nothing happening? Because when I passed the value, when I passed A in var through to this function, this function did nothing to prevent those variables from evaluating to their values. So what display actually got here was not the variable A, it was the value zero. And var got, looked like the value 0.696. I must have had a var somewhere in my session. Um, so a slider of dynamic of zero is obviously not going to, in fact, if we had shown the messages window, yeah, we would have seen, um, I guess that's, I don't know if you can see those, but it's, it's telling you that something has gone wrong here. You've tried to assign to the value zero. Well, that's because you've, you've passed through zero as the thing that you're attaching your, your interface to. How to avoid this? Well, in this case, it's fairly simple. Um, we have attributes in the Wolfram language that prevent this um, premature evaluation of variables, of expressions. In this case, we just say, well, whenever an expression gets passed to display to this function that we've named display in any argument, make sure it doesn't evaluate. And in this case, that's sufficient. So now we have, I'm going to, without doing anything else, without changing the, the display function in any other way, um, just setting this attribute is enough to get the variable passed by reference rather than by value. Um, so this is a very common mistake for people that are generating interfaces. And if you have utilities that are based on other utilities and that chain along, you'll need to hold the variables at every step uh, if at the end point they are going to want to change the value of that variable in some interactive way. Question? Yes, dynamic is hold all, and dynamic, so uh, da, 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 da. let me, it, it's, it's happening at the call to display. So if we do, let me simulate this. So f of a, b, let's say a is one, b is two, hold of f of a, b does not allow this to evaluate, but then we say, um, we say what? Well, this is uh, perhaps this is not the best. Da, 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 da. What if you enter a uh, rattle oh, A and this in dynamic on point where you call display A and bar going e, e, Okay, so so I don't know if people in the back can hear what's going on here. Um, the question, the first question is, uh, can you explain exactly why A and var are leaking here? Because they seem to be wrapped in a holding construct. Um, and then there was another a follow-up suggestion that we wrap A and var individually in, in expressions that have their own holding attributes to prevent them from evaluating. Um, both of those are valid points. In fact, if you had the notebook in front of you and you open the bonus section, you might see, um, you, you might see a reference to one of those. Um, but yes, the, the, the evaluation leak comes from evaluating display of A comma var. Right, I, I'm, I'm not even going to try to simulate it. it. It's coming from, from evaluating that inside of dynamic, yes? Because dynamic translates to uh, dynamic box of two boxes of this thing and two boxes of display, and this is, this is going to allow A and var to evaluate. Yeah. Okay, again, bonus section, yours for later. Okay, so that's one common difficulty. I'm going to show you now a common um, pattern that we invented for Manipulate and we've used, it, it became so useful um, that I think we've used it in just about every interface since. Um, and that's a sense of versioning the utility function that generates the interface boxes. 
Um, so here I have a, another very simple example. I guess it's the same simple example with a different name. Um, so we have a function that creates an interface. It's a very simple interface. It has hold all. Um, but you'll notice that I added a first argument. Um, you don't really care the structure of how you add this argument, but the important thing is that I have some way of knowing that this is a particular version of this utility. This is version one of this utility. It has nothing to do with the Mathematica version. Um, and so the thing that gets burned into the notebook for this interface knows that it is version one of this utility. If we were to look at the boxes, you know, it's a call to this utility function, version one. Why is that important? It seems sort of silly. Um, but it does allow us to do some really nice things. For one thing, it allows us to, in a targeted way, update a particular uh, calling signature for the utility to do something different. So say we learned, you know, day one of uh, summer school, we learned about labeled slider and we're really happy with ourselves. Um, then day two, we learned about uh, 2D layout constructs and styling constructs and we wanted to update all of our interfaces to take advantage of those. Well, if we update the definition of this down value, um, then as soon as I evaluate this input, that previous output is going to change automatically. So we can, in a targeted way, update the down value for just a particular rendering of the boxes. Um, it also lets us cleanly say, well, now I have a brand new version of the box generating function and I want to do something completely different because I know about some new box, because I've learned something new about the front end or the kernel and I'm going to do something fundamentally different. I don't want the new interfaces to, con con to conflict with the old ones. So the thing, so I've learned about some new controls now, um, and I burn this into notebooks. It's the same function, but a new version number. Why not just use a new function? Well, the one nice way, one nice thing about keeping these all in the same, attached to the same function, is that we can do the following. Say I have a newer version of the front end, a newer version of my code, generates a newer version of the output boxes, version three. I send it to my users. My users don't yet have my new code. What should that look like for them? Well, I can't give them version three, um, but I can set up their version one of my package so that it does something nice and clean when they get version three boxes that their code otherwise doesn't know about. Um, so we can have, as part of you know, the very first iteration of this, you have a catch-all for this, for this function that says, you know, I've, I've gone through and I've tried all of these and I don't have the right down value for displaying this version. And you can say that in the interface. So here is, here is you know, the fall-through version that your users would see. Um, and we actually do this. I don't know, has anybody ever seen something like this in Mathematica proper? Because we do it for manipulate. We do it for interval slider. I'm curious to know if anybody's ever noticed this. But okay, so, so we have bumped version numbers in manipulate. We haven't bumped them for interval slider yet, so maybe that's not quite so surprising that nobody's seen those. Um, but it's interesting that nobody's seen the manipulate ones. So if, if the manipulate boxes were generated by a newer kernel and then tried to open in an ancient front end of some sort, um, you, might, you might see something like this. Okay, so this is, this is backwards proofing and forwards proofing your, your box structures. I think this is, this is a really nice approach. Okay. Um, what else can I say about this? So we get a lot just by using dynamic, just by having dynamic of a function that generates these things. We get a lot of stuff for free. Um, because the, the construction of those boxes is delayed, that means anything that looks for front end options, anything that looks for kernel state, all of that stuff is delayed until render time. Each time you open the notebook, you get a fresh, you get a fresh look at what the front end and kernel look like, and that can affect um, how the boxes look. So for instance, there's a front end option, default control placement. Um, this was developed back uh, before we had iOS support, but we were starting to look at touchscreen devices running the desktop front end, and we realized that with controls on the top, your hand is in the way of the thing that you're trying to control. So we needed some automatic way to, to change the... So without changing the boxes of Manipulate at all, this is just responding to 
the user's state because the user had set some option um, that, that says, okay, now every manipulate that gets rendered from here on out for the remainder of the session will look like this. If you save this, send it to your friend, your cousin, uh, who doesn't have this setting, it will look normal. It will look like the slider will be on the top. You know, this is, this is dependent on the, uh, the, 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 the state of your front end. Okay. Um, and I think this is my last real slide. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about loading your code. Um, because there's a question about, you know, you have a dynamic call to a function that generates the interface. How do you make sure that that function that generates the interface is actually present and all of your code is actually loaded? Um, so I'm going to show a couple of techniques surrounding this question. One is to acknowledge that that dynamic could do more than just call a single function. It could have a small amount of logic in it that detects whether your code is loaded or not and displays one thing or something else depending on the answer to is your code loaded. Um, so, so here is a, an interface that looks like one thing, looks like a button if the code is not loaded and after the code is loaded, so it looks like something else. Of course, these are just small academic displays. You can get arbitrarily fancy with their, with their look. Um, if you happen to know things about declare package and stub files, you should make sure that the function that generates the interface is one of those auto-loaded symbols. Um, it is one of those that you declare the package for so that it can kick off the process of loading your code automatically. And if you want to use the initialization, that's fine. Um, here is a setup uh, that I'm showing you how to use an asynchronous initialization along with a synchronous dynamic to do the following. It, show, it automatically loads this code while it's running and doesn't provide the interface until the code is completed. So I'll run this for a third time. While the initialization is running, we see a please wait state. When it's done, it's in a ready state. Um, and again, you can get arbitrarily clever with this please wait state. I think this one uses a, a percolator to give the user something to watch while, while your code is running. And this is how Manipulate's synchronous initialization option works, for instance, uh, for those of you who, hasn't, who haven't uh, seen that in action. It provides a, an indeterminate progress indicator while asynchronous initializations are happening. And that's exa it uses exactly this technique. Um, but be aware that when you're initializing and when you have dynamic vi variables running around, you do want those to play nicely with one another. If you should think carefully if you're developing one of these interfaces. Think carefully about what would happen if you had two of them on the screen at the same time. If they're both trying to set global state, they may well get into a tennis match um, and you'll see cell brackets flashing and you'll, you'll find that typing becomes unresponsive. Um, so it, it, is, it is some additional thought needs to go into what should multiple interfaces do while they're open at the same time. Um, so initialize responsibly. Right, okay. So, and the rest are bonus slides. Um, I've covered just about everything I wanted to cover. Uh, main takeaways, simplify what gets written into notebook files. Store this, use dynamic module to store the state, use dynamic to, uh, to create the interface boxes at render time, uh, use dynamic also to respond to environment changes, and, and use this nice utility versioning to support forward backward compatibility. And uh, using all of these approaches, you can ensure a great experience for your past, present, and future uses. So thanks for your attention. I think we have time for some questions. Yes. If I understand what you told us, simply using the manipulate command will be low to get for you, right? Uh, the, the comment is, if you use manipulate, you don't have to do anything else to get these, these benefits. And yes, that's true. If manipulate is sufficient for you or for your users, um, then there's no need for you to reinvent any wheels. Um, but this, this was the approach we took with manipulate. And again, with interval slider and audio and the Wolfram Alpha function and a few other things. Um, and uh, right, so, so as you develop your own interfaces, this is, this is, the, this is, this is the, the, these are signposts on that trail for you to follow. Yes?
Yep. Um, the question is, could there be unintended side effects from setting the hold all attribute for a symbol? And absolutely there could be. Um, if, in this case, since you are the one that's in control of writing the boxes, of constructing the call to this utility, and you're the one that's writing the definition of the utility, um, all of these things are in your lap to take care of. But absolutely, I mean, if, if you expect, for instance, um, what you could not do in this case, after you set hold all, you would no longer be able to do something like add a down value whose left hand side matched you know, a partially evaluated symbol. Because, in, because of the hold all attribute, you would never see zero, display will never see zero here. It will only see a variable given the way that we're calling it uh, up there. So yes, there there is there is the potential for a fallout if if uh, and as you as you do a couple of these you you'll you'll get accustomed to what that might look like. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, enjoy the rest of the conference and the pizza, and uh, I'll hang out here for a few minutes because I think the room is now finished. If people have other questions, so thanks.